Hey guys, welcome to Relentless Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. Uh, real quick, we're gonna get into an awesome message, but we first just got a few announcements for you guys. Uh, so number one, every Sunday, somebody's first Sunday, even online. And so if you're new to Relentless Church, then we would love to get connected with you. And so uh, again, if it's your first, second, maybe third time watching, feel free to let us know in the comments below and we'll have somebody uh, from staff reach out and get connected with you. Um, we also want to let you guys know that we have uh, community groups that meet throughout the week and throughout Phoenix. Uh, and so everybody needs community. And so if you're looking to dive into community at Relentless Church, uh, then we would love to get you connected to a community group. And so you can sign up for groups online at our website, uh, www.relentlessphx.com. Uh, or you can also click on the link in our bio on Facebook or Instagram. Um, we also want to let you guys know that our next Newcomers Dessert is coming up. And so Newcomers Dessert is a great place uh, just to meet the staff, uh, get to hear a little bit about Relentless Church, and get to ask any questions that you might have. And so if you want to join us at Newcomers Dessert, uh, again, you can comment on the video below and we'll get you the details for that. Lastly, we just want to remind you guys that our college nights and prayer nights are just around the corner. And so you can find more details for that uh, by following us uh, on Instagram or Facebook at RelentlessPHX. But that's all we've got for today. Uh, we hope that you guys enjoy the service. What is up, guys? I have the pleasure to be bringing the word tonight. I'm Pastor Ben, and we are going to be continuing our series through 1 Peter, Hope in the Dark. Last week, Bryson was speaking on submitting to leadership and authority, and tonight, Peter continues that theme in our passage in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But Peter shifts the focus to what a God-honoring marriage relationship should look like in regard to submission and authority itself. And the importance of this tonight is to understand what God intended marriage to be and how through honoring God in marriage, we as Christians can be a shining light and further bring hope found in a dark world around us. So let's pray and dive in through working through those concepts and see what God is calling us to learn tonight as Christians and taking that into our marriage relationships. And even singles in the room, we can be applying this and we're going to see how as we dive into the message. Let me pray in real quick. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity just to dive into your word. Uh, speak through me tonight. Uh, thank you for giving us marriage as an opportunity to see what our relationship with you should look like and allow us to pull from the text what you have tonight and advance your kingdom and all that we do. It's your name we pray. Amen. Now, before we dive into the text, we need to pause and take a moment to better understand God's purpose in marriage. We're going to be working through some context. Somebody say context for me real quick. Y'all with me? There we go. That's an important one. So having that foreknowledge and the context will be important and better understanding why Peter is putting so much emphasis in this passage on the roles within the marriage relationship. You see, marriage is the highest example of what our relationship with Christ should look like. It's a union of two flesh becoming one. Husband and wife are dying of their old self and becoming one and uniting at the altar and turning into something that's new and holy. Now, it's not to say single believers in the room are unholy or bad or that you guys are awful people. No, God has just simply set apart marriage as an earthly example. We as Christians can look to in a tangible way to understand our relationship with Christ, which bring, brings God glory. You see, in how Christ sacrificed himself for believers and believers are called to sacrifice in life for him. Marriage is a relationship built on sacrifice for the benefit of both husband and wife and to the glory of God. And this is a passage again, written with instruction directly to husbands and wives as Dylan just read, but it's also meant for our singles in the room. Where y'all at? I want to hear y'all real quick. Yeah, that's most of us in here. That's okay. I got a word for y'all tonight too. And this message is not just something that you guys should take notes on and put out of your mind until you are married or zone out completely. You see, since marriage represents our relationship with Jesus as Christians, all of us in here can apply what Peter says about marriage, either in our relationship with our spouse and or our relationship with who Jesus is directly. So all of us as usual tonight have some skin in the game. With that in mind, let's dive into the text to see what that's gonna look like. Verse one states, likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Let's pause there. What is Peter saying here? I'll put it really simply. He's simply saying this, exactly what he said. Wives, submit to the authority of your husbands. 
Why? So that they may see Christ in you and be won by your conduct, not your words. Christ speaks best through your action as a wife in obedient submission to your husband, is what Peter is saying here. Now, for an unbelieving husband, this submission is what will bring him to faith. And it's why Peter states that wives live in submission and obedience. And for a believing husband, this submission will help him in better living out his role within the marriage relationship. And trust me, we're going to get to the husbands in a minute. So we're going to get there. But right now, I'm going to stick with the wives because that's what Peter's sticking with. But wives submitting to the authority of their husband is God's good and perfect will and is necessary in the marriage relationship to be Christ-like and be fruitful for those reasons. Now we need to take a minute and talk through some things about what Peter is and is not saying in the first two verses that are important to understand. First, your submission to Christ as a woman, as a wife, oversees your submission to your husband. Peter is not saying, follow your husband into sin. If your husband is leading you into sin, pump the brakes. Peter is not telling wives, yo, your husband's sinning, so I want you to follow him in sin and continue to sin with him. Your obligation, your submission and obedience to the Lord oversees and comes first before your submission to your husband. Everybody in this room should understand that. Nobody should be led into sin by anybody. A husband shouldn't even be doing that to their wife, though Peter is saying a husband leads their wife and a wife submits to the husband. That's in a God-honoring relationship and a God-honoring husband should not be somebody who is leading their wife into sin in the first place. So let's pump the brakes on that. Second, this submission Peter is calling wives to have is solely to their husbands and not all men. This submission is sacred in regard to what happens at the altar where two people become one flesh. And that is in the context of what that submission needs to occur in, not to all men, women. Okay, Peter's not saying, hey, you're a woman. So any man that comes up to you on the street and tells you to do something, you better do it. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, be obedient and be submissive to your husband in the marriage relationship. We also need to be clear of this when Peter speaks of submission, because this becomes a struggle for some people. And I understand why, because it might seem like Peter is saying that men are better than women. He's not saying that. You see, submission to does not equal less than. Jesus submitted to the authority of the father, not because he was lesser, but because that was his role and purpose on earth. He submitted and obeyed his parents, not because he was lesser. He's literally God. He's higher than Joseph, but here on earth, he was the son of Joseph and Mary, and he lived in obedience to them as his parents. Submission to does not equal less than. You see, without the son being obedient and submitting to the father, the father's will could not be completed through the son. That same truth follows with wives submitting to husbands. Wives should do this because it's God's good and perfect will for what the marriage relationship is to look like. And for a marriage relationship to be fruitful, both husband and wife need to understand their roles within what marriage is called to be and what God is calling it to look like. Next, submission is not a reward for a husband's good behavior. Peter's not saying, okay, only submit to a husband when he's acting right. He's not saying that. He's saying being willing to be obedient and submissive to your husband, even when he's struggling a little bit. Now, not following your husband into sin, it's not what Peter's saying again. I want to make that very clear. But it's not a reward for a husband's good behavior. It's not like a doggy treat, right? It's not like I'm gonna be putting some peanut butter in a Kong because I'm your wife and you're, you know, you're doing what I wanna do. You're cleaning up the garage for me. Okay, that, that's not what Peter's saying either. We need to understand that. It's a biblical principle independent of a husband's behavior and it's not a, a do this reward type system because marriage isn't a transactional relationship. Again, it's a sacrificial one. When wives obediently submit to husbands, they're living out God's good and perfect will and denying the desires of the flesh. And that flesh desire is rooted in sin and can be tracked back to Adam and Eve in the garden itself. 
God is speaking to Eve, excuse me, in Genesis 3, 16, after the fall, and he says, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. This was a consequence directly of the fall. This is the nature of sin women and wives specifically have had as a consequence of the fall and of sin originally. You see, man and God's will always has had authority as the head of house, even in the garden. And husband and wife lived in perfect harmony, understanding and trusting God and their roles within their relationship. Again, this was God's good, beautiful, and perfect will. However, once sin entered the world, this perfect unity and relationship was broken and fractured as seen in Genesis 3.16. Wives submitting to their husbands is how wives are called to deny the flesh, that urge, that sinful desire to try and rule over their husband. This desire again is of sin and wives live out that nature, broken relationships that happen because of the fall just by default nowadays, because we all have a sin nature, can't be restored back to the beauty of God's will. There will be toil and strife in a marriage with this struggle. And that is why submission to a husband is a crucial way in which a wife is called to deny desires of the flesh and bring God glory in the same way Christ brought glory to the Father through submissive obedience and sacrificial love. This honors God and restores beauty to the brokenness of relationship caused by sin. Because when wives live in that fashion, they are denying the flesh, sacrificing themselves and walking in the power of the spirit. And this is why wives are called to submit to their husbands. Now let's check out verses three through four to see what else Peter has to say on the marriage relationship. You guys still with me? We good? We rolling? All right, cool, cool. Verse three states, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now we need to break down that little section really quick. What is Peter saying here about wives, about the marriage relationship? He's saying this, wives are to find their beauty in the Lord, not of the world. Why? Because real beauty, true beauty comes from the hidden person of the heart. Guys, a lot of times in this letter that we're reading through 1 Peter, Peter can be all over the place and like, oh, slow down, Peter, what are you saying? He's pretty clear here. It's like cut and dry. Wives, find your beauty in the hidden person of the heart, which is exactly what he says we need to do. It's cut and dry. It's pretty simple. And this beauty isn't something you wear or print before a mirror to have. It is something you are as a woman, as a wife. The real question is, what do you depend on to make yourself beautiful? Peter's point is not that any of these things are forbidden, any of these external things are awful things, but that you should not be a woman who finds true adornment, finds your source of beauty in them. No, your source of true beauty is and should always be found in the Lord. The inner beauty of a godly woman is incorruptible, as Peter states. This means that it does not decay or get worse over time. Instead, instead, incorruptible beauty is everlasting and is therefore much greater value than the beauty that comes from what can rust and rot away and blow away into the wind. Peter then describes the character of true beauty as a gentle and quiet spirit. What does that mean? Well, these character traits are not promoted for women by our culture nowadays, yet they are very precious in the sight of God. When a wife lives out these traits and is quiet and submissive and finding her beauty in the Lord and finding it internally and focuses on who Jesus is, it allows her to better practice being submissive and obedient to her husband. We're going back to that. We're going to connect the two. Y'all ready for this? Boom. Y'all with me? All right. So being submissive and obedient to a husband is connecting to a wife's inner beauty and her finding it in the Lord, which again is God's good and perfect will. If a wife doesn't find her beauty in the Lord and instead finds it in the flesh, then they will always live in the flesh. This woman will always live with a fleshy desire and can't submit to her husband. If wives do this, they will always struggle to rule over their partner as a consequence of the nature of sin seen in Genesis 3. 
The truth is where our focus is, our actions follow. Write that down. I'm going to say it again. The truth is where our focus is, our actions follow. So Peter is telling wives to be focused on the spirit and on the Lord, not of the desires of the flesh, which leads to sin, desiring to rule over a husband. You see, and not finding her beauty inwardly and from the Lord, obedient submission can't happen for a wife. It's not gonna happen in a marriage relationship. If her focus isn't on who Jesus is and her eyes are on the flesh and on the world, then to do something that is of the spirit and trust in the Lord won't happen. The calling to be obedient, submissive, and find your beauty in the Lord are directly correlated and connected. A wife must find her beauty fully in the Lord to live out obedient submission to her husband. And this is why Peter connects the two this way within the text. Wives, he's calling you, let's be obedient and submissive to your husband in the same way that Jesus was obedient and submissive to the Father and having a quiet spirit and being willing to find your beauty in who Jesus is, not focus on these external adornments of desires of the flesh because the flesh leads to the flesh. And what your focus is on, your actions will follow. Verses five through six speaks on examples of honorable women within the text who lived in this way, in the way of the Lord. Let's see what Peter has to say of the importance of that. So in the first four verses, he's saying, wives, yo, do these things. And now in verses five through six, he's breaking down, okay, here's some examples of some faithful, obedient, holy women in scripture that did these things. In verse five, he says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Let's stop there. In this part of the text, Peter reminds women that he isn't calling them to a new standard. This is nothing new, but this was something that was practiced even by holy women of former times back in the Old Testament, back in the OT for my Bible college students, right? Right? When women submit to their husbands and when they don't put trust in their outward adornment, they're like the holy women of former times, like Sarah was with Abraham who trusted in God. And you see what a godly woman led a godly man to, right? Literally have Christians today because of Abraham and Sarah. And they powerfully demonstrate their faith. You see, a wife can trust her own ability to influence and control her husband, or she can trust God and be submissive. There's two options, only two. A woman can trust her own outward beauty and adornment, or she can trust God and cultivate a gentle and quiet spirit. And it all comes back to trusting God or lack thereof. One way leads to strife, struggle, and a broken relationship bound by the shackles of the nature of sin. The other leads to a beautiful relationship centered in God's good and perfect will. Peter's telling wives to choose the latter option and to be like the honorable women found in scripture. Peter also speaks on how living in this godly fashion is a way to live without fear. Now you're thinking, oh, you're being quiet and submissive. How is that living without fear? That's a disconnect there, Pete. What are you saying, homie? Like, I don't know where you're going with this. Let's break it down. You see, true submission full of faith in God has no room for fear or terror. It does good and leaves the result to God and not to man. It takes somebody who is not living in fear to step outside the flesh, to not be willing to live in the world and say, no, I'm not gonna do these things. I'm gonna trust in the Lord and I'm gonna trust in what he has for me because he is good. The words do good in verse six reminds us that true submission is not a sulking surrender to authority. It is an active embrace of God's will, demonstrating trust in him. A woman who lives in this way does it because again, they set aside the desires of the flesh by not being afraid of the ways of the world and what it will think because her heart is set on the Lord and she desires to please him and she's not living in fear of the world. 
And that's what Peter's saying there. That's what Peter is calling wives of faith, godly wives, godly women to do in their marriage relationships. Submit to their husbands and be focused on the Lord, finding their beauty in the Lord and living without fear of the world. Now let's see what Peter has to say about godly husbands in verse seven. Where are my husbands at? All right, we got two, let's go. Three, I'm up here too, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was funny. <laughs> so we're moving on to husbands, man. We just spoke a lot about wives, but we got just as much Peter's putting on husbands in the marriage relationship as well. He's saying, yo, I got a word for you too, my brothers. You ain't getting off the hook. There's some stuff in here you need to know too. He says in verse seven, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. And that's how the passage ends. Man, seven verses, he's pretty cut and dry. Last week in the passage, he was talking about authority and the government and this and that. And Bryson spit fired. He was like, yo, this is what he's saying. Peter in this passage is like, yo, this is what it is. This is how I'm gonna need you how to live, okay? And now he's talking about the husbands and he's saying, husbands, do these things. We're about to break it down real quick. You see the Greek word that the ESV translates within the text here as live, when Peter charges godly husbands to live with their wives is deeper than what the translation may seem to imply. He's putting emphasis on the word live as actually he's saying, husbands, live with your wife and value her. Not just husband, live with your wife. He's saying, no, brother, live with your wife. You see, a godly husband lives with his wife. He doesn't merely just share a house but he truly lives with her. He, re he recognizes the great point of Paul's teaching on marriage in Ephesians 5, 28, as Paul states, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. You see, a godly husband understands the essential unity or oneness God has established between husband and wife. You see husbands and men in the room that are gonna be husbands someday. When you care for your wife, you're caring for yourself. When you're not taking care of your wife and you're not doing what you should be doing and honoring her and going out of your way to make sure she's taken care of and protected, you're also not taking care of yourself because we're one flesh. When you marry and you go into that covenant and you join in that union, you are one flesh under God and what happens to you happens to her. So he's saying, yo, uh, if you're not taking care of your wife, like you're not taking care of yourself either. So husbands, men, let's step it up. Peter then goes on to express that husbands are, are supposed to live with their wives in understanding. As Peter is expressing that a godly husband undertake the important job of understanding his wife. He's like, yo, husbands, I need you to live with your wife. And I also need you to understand her. Like, I know women and wives, y'all have layers. Y'all are, are tough sometimes. Like, I'm gonna be real. Like, it's tough to understand my wife sometimes. Sometimes she's just like crying. I'm like, are you upset? She's like, no. I'm like, are you angry? She's like, no. She's like, are you sad? She's like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, let's back to square one. Let's try this again, right? But as husbands, that's the stuff we're called to do. We need to be willing to jump into really trying and trying to understand our wives because again, we're one flesh. And when she's struggling, yo, I'm in that boat too. If we sink it, we sink in together. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's go. Husbands are called to undertake the important job of understanding his wife. Live with your wife and understand her. Be in relationship with who your wife is. By knowing her well, he is also able to demonstrate as a husband his love for her far more effectively. And this is important. This is important because we have the role as husbands that Jesus has in the marriage relationship with his bride as the church. He's the bridegroom, right? Okay, we, we as husbands, we the groom, right? So literally we can't be taking our roles lightly because we kind of taking the role of Jesus and that's kind of scary. And so like Jesus loves his church, loves his bride. Yo, husbands, we're called to love our bride, our wives the same way. We'll get into that in a second, but Peter then goes on to express that a husband is called to give his wife honor in all that he does. A godly husband knows how to make his wife feel honored. Though she submits to him, 
He takes care that she does not feel like she is an employee or under a tyrant. Okay, that's not what a godly husband does. It's like, hey, you should, you should just listen to me because uh, I have authority over you. No, brother, like, pump the brakes again. You got to be one to understand your wife and you're not, she's not like, you're not like her boss. Okay. Okay. This is a relationship. You're called to understand her. You're called to honor her. Okay. She's not your employee. That's not a very honoring situation. And that's what, that's not what we're called to do as husbands. And that's not what the relationship and our role in marriage is called to be as the man, as the husband. He's saying, Peter's like, yo, honor your wife and care for her. Go out of your way to make sure that she feels special, that she knows she's your bride and that you are here for her as Jesus did for his church. Can I get an amen? Yeah. yeah. And Peter stated, and give honor to your wife. The word in the ancient Greek language for the wife is a rare word in scripture, meaning more literally the feminine one. It suggests that the women's feminine nature should prompt the husband to honor her because she is a woman, because she is your wife. This was a radical teaching in the world in which Peter lived. In that ancient culture, a husband had absolute rights and control over his wife, and every husband in the culture pretty much lived that out. You could bank on it, send it to the house, get your money back, right? And the wife had virtually no rights in the marriage. And on top of that, all the duties and obligations in marriage, guess what? They fell on the wife. And Peter says, nah, dog, nope. Peter had a radical teaching here in the text, and that's this, that husbands have a God-ordained duty and obligation towards their wife as well. And that's being that godly husbands should care for and honor their wives first and foremost. And this responsibility should not be taken lightly because again, as husbands are called to care for and sacrifice themselves for their wives in the same way Christ cares for and sacrificed himself for his bride, God's people. Christ and his relationship with his church is literally the standard and model husbands should look to in understanding how to be in relationship with their wife. That is why husbands should take their role seriously. Peter then goes on to show how a godly husband's role in regard to caring for his wife as the weaker vessel is important. Now, hold on, ladies. I'm gonna stop there. Peter's not saying, yo, women, you weak. Okay, you're lesser than. No, that's not, that's not what he's saying. Okay, he's talking here about a woman's relatively physically weaker um, phys physical strength in comparison to a man, an economic standing in comparison to a man. Because back then, again, men had all of the rights. They had, were the only people that had form of getting money. They were the ones that got the job. So socioeconomical and physical. He's like, wives are typically physically weaker than women. Now, socioeconomically, that's different now. That was of that time, okay? Where my women's out here, like, girl power, right? Y'all go and do your thing, right? Y'all get jobs. Y'all got careers. All that's great stuff, and that's important, okay? Peter's not taking that away from you. He's not saying you don't need that. He's not saying you shouldn't step into that, okay? You go and do those great things, right? He's not saying that. He's not saying men should have all this power, all these authority because women are awful and they're weaker and they're lesser humans. That's not what he's saying. He's just expressing that typically women are weaker physically and that fits into the role of the husband to protect her. But again, goes on to show a, godly's, a godly husband's role is to protect his wife. See, men aren't necessarily stronger spiritually than women, but they, again, they are generally stronger than women physically. As Peter brought in the idea of a woman's feminine nature with the words, the wife, within the passage, within verse seven, he continues in appreciating the feminine nature of a wife here and how a husband should respond to it. Therefore, a godly husband recognizes whatever limitations his wife has physically, and he does not expect more from her than what is appropriate and kind and protects and covers his wife and all that he does. He's essentially saying, as a husband, you are responsible for protecting and caring for your wife as a godly man. That is on you. When I, when I read this verse, uh, this part of the verse, uh, it reminded me of the, this TikTok. I couldn't find the video to, to post or I'd have it up. It'd be a lot cooler. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, summarize it real quick. You guys have all probably seen it. Um, it's this dad. He's like really young too. He's like my age. And uh, he 
goes in the bathroom. He takes a little selfie video with his little baby, right? And he says, it's this little mini me. Like they look dead up alike. He said, this is my baby. Ain't nobody finna touch him. Y'all know that video? Nobody in here see that video? Man, y'all are quiet, man. All right. So essentially in this video, he's like, yo, this is my baby and I'm protective. Ain't nobody fit touch. He's joking around, right? But it's essentially his mini me. And I, it made me think of this video for some reason because it's like, that's kind of the role of a husband in a relationship. Like, yo, this is my wife and I'm a protector. Like, I'm going to care for her. I'm going to honor her. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure that she is cared for and that she is honored because this is what I am here to do. This is my role in this relationship. I'm going to make sure she's covered, she's protected because she's my wife and ain't nobody going to touch her. I get an amen? That's my wife. That's the, that's the mentality that Peter is calling us as husbands to have. We need to protect our women. We need to be able to honor them in all that we do. We need to be able to live with them and understanding and not use our position of authority to just rule over our wives as a tyrant, as if she's an employee under us. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, cover your wife, understand her, protect her, care for her, honor her in all that you do. Peter then goes on to show how husbands and wives are both heirs to God's kingdom together in this verse. And from this, we can see that a godly husband realizes that his spouse is not only his wife, but also his co-heir in heaven. And part of their inheritance in the Lord is only realized in their, was, in their oneness as husband and wife. This reminds husbands that even though they have been given a great authority with the marriage, their wives are still equal to them in spiritual privilege and internal importance. They are joint heirs in heaven. And this in part is why a husband is called to protect, care for, and honor his wife in all that he does. That is our role in the marriage relationship. Peter lastly ends by talking about the consequences of a husband who doesn't do this within a relationship with his wife. As the failure to do this and live as a godly husband has spiritual consequences if you're not willing to live in that fashion. Peter states that it can and it will, he says, it can and it will hinder a husband's prayer. Charles Spurgeon says it best when he comments on Peter's words here, as he says, anything which hinders prayer must be wrong. If any management of the family or want of management is injuring our power in prayer, there is an urgent demand for an alteration. You see, Peter is making it clear that if husbands don't live out their calling to honor, care for, and protect their wife, then their prayers will be hindered and there will be strife in their relationship with God. And you can bank on it with their wife as well, but most importantly, there's gonna be strife even in their relationship with God. And anything that hinders our relationship with the Father, as Spurgeon just stated in that quote, and keeps us from him from listening to our prayers, this should be something we as godly men strive to stay clear of, away from, or if for some reason we've fallen into that, yo, let's drop it and get as far away as we can from that because anything that gets me far away from God, I don't want any part of. And guys, this is the reason as husbands, we shouldn't be taking our marriage role lightly. To lead our wives well in a God-honoring fashion through honoring, deeply loving, caring for, and protecting our wives is very important. Because as scripture states, again, they are co-heirs with us in the kingdom as image bearers of Christ and are an extension of ourselves as one flesh in the sight of the Lord. And this is why Peter puts emphasis on the role of the husband within a godly marriage. So what's the impact of all this? This is what Peter's saying. Why, why is this important? We just work through the roles. It's because of this truth, guys. When husbands and wives live out these actions within a marriage, God is glorified through it. And a couple in that can be lights that bring forth hope into the darkness. You see, because a God-honoring marriage points others directly to Jesus. And that is the biggest reason husbands and wives should live out God's good and perfect will within their marriage relationship. 
So guys, to conclude, wives, submit to the authority of your husbands and find your beauty in the Lord because this is God's good and perfect will. And Christ will be seen to your husbands through you in this way. And husbands, let's lead our wives well in a God-honoring fashion. Yo, that's your wife. Remember that. Don't ever forget that. Through honoring, deeply loving, caring for, and protecting our wives as husbands, This is how we live in a godly fashion, how we honor God in that, because as scripture states, they are co-heirs with us in the kingdom as image bearers of Christ once again and are an extension of ourselves as one flesh in the sight of the Lord. When a marriage encompasses these principles on the parts of both husband and wife, God is honored and glorified. The marriage relationship is restored to the beauty That is God's good and perfect will that was seen in the garden before sin entered the world. And one's marriage will shine a light of hope in the dark. And that will allow others to see Christ in and through your union. We have two choices in marriage. We can live in strife. We cannot live out what God is calling us to do, what Peter is stating here. And there's going to be strife in our union, in our relationship, and for men in our relationship directly with the Father. Or we can be obedient and all of us submit to God in our relationship and wives submit to your husbands and husbands honor your wife. And we can actually live out what marriage and the relationship of marriage was called to be and what it looked like in the garden before sin entered the world with Adam and Eve. Christ will see us through our union if we're willing to live out these things and be glorified through it and lead others to Jesus. And we can be lights and beacons of hope in a dark world. Lastly, all of us here tonight, married or single, can look at marriage in order to better understand our relationship with Jesus. You see, Christ again is our bridegroom and we are his bride as the church, as God's people. Let's be willing to submit to his authority in sacrificial love as a wife submits to her husband, giving ourselves to him as he has given up himself for us. Guys, let's live out these principles as we leave here tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity just to dive into your word. Thank you for what Peter was stating here. Thank you for what God has given us, the perfect picture of what a relationship should look like. Thank you for having this opportunity to preach through this and understand and dive into how a marriage relationship is the perfect example and closest example of what we're going to be able to get in closeness and relationship with you. Let us see that as married people and as singles and live those principles out in our relationship with our spouses for people who have one and all of us in our relationship with you directly. And so in your name we pray. Amen.